what ends up happening is our body adapts. If you're not dead, your body doesn't adapt to stress. If you're alive, your body adapts to stress. And that is what we're doing every day. A healthy person adapts to stress much better than an unhealthy person. People come into my office day in, day out with the same problems. Either hip problems, back problems, neck problems. And they're all so consistent. And these problems are getting worse and worse and worse. We're seeing them in much younger population than ever before. I'm adjusting people every single day, helping get them out of pain, but they're still coming in with the same problems. So there has to be something that the body is adapting to. You have to look at how you're living because you are a product of your daily rituals. There are three laws that are at play that most people have problems with, and they have issues with it at night when they're sleeping. What controls everything in the human body? The nervous system. Right? The brain through the nervous system. And how important is it that your nervous system functions optimally from now and for the rest of your life? It's significantly important. The average individual will toss and turn about 40 times a night. That's crazy. Why is that? What's the reason for that? So you're falling asleep in a position and in 20 minutes later, you're moving out of that position. You're not in control of it. What's in control of it? Your brain. The one of the number one reasons you toss and turn is because the body is in pain. Dr. Peter Martone, welcome back, brother, to the Keto Camp Podcast. Dr. Sleep Right himself is back. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. This is great. Uh, you, were, you were back with us episode 324, which was a couple years ago. Wow, 300, and you started from one? Started with one, of course. <laughs> we're, at, we're, we're, we're in the 600s now, Peter, so this is going to be 600 and something. Holy mackerel. Good. Congratulations. <laughs> that That is a, a testament to your dedication to your audience and your success. Good, great job. Thank you, Peter. I appreciate that. And I was just so fascinated because we talked about different sleep positions and we're going to touch a little bit about that as well. But I understand that you operate by law. Uh, and I love that because you can't argue laws. You, there's universal laws, there's world laws, and you could disagree with them. But it's obvious that gravity, for example, it's a world law. You could be like, you could say things like, I don't believe in gravity, but you could hold something up in front of that person and drop it and they could see right in front of them. So there's three primary laws that you operate when it comes to teaching your patients and clients health, especially as it relates to sleep position and sleep hygiene. What are those three laws? How did you discover them? And let's dive deep into them. Yeah, it and and that's I, I love starting. You know, you basically be telling me is start with an anchor, something that you can't deny, and then let's think about building a philosophy or a a framework on something that is that secure that it doesn't change, like the placebo. Um, but so what ends up happening is our body adapts, right? There's adaptation to our body. So. If you're not dead, your body doesn't adapt to stress. If you're alive, your body adapts to stress. And that is what we're doing every day. So for instance, if we go outside and it's cold outside, adaptation would be shivering. That's adapting to cold, your body tries to warm. If you eat food, it adapts by breaking that food down in digestion. So digesting. So a, a healthy person adapts to stress much better than an unhealthy person. So when we look at that, we want to look at how our body adapts because a lot of people were coming into my office just to give you a little history at, the, at, at right now i've been a chiropractor for over 23 years and people come into my office day in day out with the same problems either hip problems back problems neck problems and they're all so consistent and these problems are getting worse and worse and worse and they get we're seeing them in much younger the population than ever before. So, so I started to, to look at my own health and I had herniated a disc back, you know, about 10, 10 and a half, no, no, now 13 years ago and said to myself, how does it come to this? I'm a chiropractor. I'm adjusting people. I'm adjusting people every single day, helping get them out of pain, but they're still coming in with the same problems. So there has to be something that the body is adapting to. So, so because if you, if you're not happy with your health or you're not happy with, you know, how much pain you're in or discomfort you're in, you have to look at your lifestyle. You have to look at how you're living because you are a product of your daily rituals. So there are three laws that are at play that most people have problems with and, and they have issues with it at night when they're sleeping. 
and this is number one, tissue adapts to the stresses applied. That's Davis's law. So for instance, if you put a weight in your hand and you start exercising with that weight, the tissue will adapt and remold and you will get a stronger bicep. It's adaptation. That is what happens. That is adapting to stress. The next one is bone will adapt to the stresses that are applied in the forces that are applied. So for instance, I have a straight arm. If I take this arm and I hold it bent, in five years, I will have a bent arm because the tissue will, I mean, the, the bone will adapt. If I lean, let's say I'm a hundred pound individual and I put 70 pounds on one leg and only 30 pounds on the other leg, the leg with 70 pounds over a period of time will have more bone mass than the leg with 30 pounds. You will have osteopenia in one side. That's because the tissue adapts and the body is constantly adapting. And then my favorite law out of all of them, this is my favorite one. And this is a law that stems from birth and it, tra and it translates all the way through your life. And, and this is the one that is controlling our posture. So think about this. Most people say, oh, I have a short leg length. I have a short leg. I have a, my hip is out of alignment. Oh, my... My, 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 my torso's twisted. There's one law that is, oh, oh my, my core is weak. I got a weak core. There's one law that is managing all of that. And that is the writing reflex. And the writing reflex simply stated is body posture adjust to head position, which means the way that we hold our head, forward head posture, we hold it to the side, our body posture adapts to that. So there are three laws at play that we need to really dive into when we talk about maintaining a healthy structure, and that's Davis's law, tissue remolds, Wolf's law, bone remolds, and number three, the writing reflex, body posture adjusts to head position. Mm, I love the laws. Okay, let's talk about your favorite one, the writing reflex, the body adjusts to posture position. And... Now we have everybody on their cell phone, you know, and I'm guilty of it too, right, Peter? It's uh, we're looking down, we are losing that curve in the neck during the day, and then we're going to bed, and we're also achieving the wrong status with the wrong posture at, at nighttime. And you focused a lot on, okay, what can we do at night? Because that's going to be six, seven, eight hours, you're going to be in bed. What can we do while you're sleeping to adjust this body posture to find the perfect sleep position? and get that curvature back. So how did you come to that discovery? I know you shared a little bit on the previous episode, but it's been a couple of years. How did you come to that discovery that this is what you want to focus on? You want to adjust the, the sleep posture. And if you're watching on YouTube, you're holding up a spinal cord right there. So right now I'm holding up a spine, right? This spine protects the central nervous system and it helps maintain structure. So you are, you are supposed to have curves in your spine, specifically one in the neck, and then the, the same curve is in the lower back. And then the thoracic curve is opposite. It's called lordotic curve and kyphotic curve. So when you, a normal individual will have a nice curve in their neck. And the weight of the head will be over the weight of the hips. So basically, if you can imagine, if you stand up straight, the weight of your head should be over the weight of your hips. So for instance... If that your weight of your head is the weight of a bowling ball. So picture taking a large bowling ball, holding it in your hands, and holding it on your chest. Relatively, that bowling ball, the weight's going to translate all the way down to the hips, and it's not going to take a lot of energy to hold that bowling ball because it's weighted equally. Now, in retrospect, let's take that bowling ball and hold it out Three, you know, two feet with extended arms. It's going to put a lot of effective weight on your shoulders, and you are always going to have shoulder tension if you hold the further out that you hold that bowling ball. Mm. So when you hold, when you lose the curve of our neck due to our poor sleeping positions, our head leans forward. So the weight, effective weight of your head 
is over your hips. Every inch that your head comes forward, it's an extra 20 pounds of effective weight on the back of your neck and in your, between your shoulder blades. Every inch it moves forward is equivalent to about 20 pounds of effective pressure and weight is what you said. Yes. Wow. And so the body is efficient. So it adapts by twisting the spine to bring it, to bring you, to bring the body back. So what happens is the neck comes forward and then the spine twists to bring the head back into position. So everybody that comes into my office with back pain or hip misalignments, it's due to compensation from forward head posture. How do you, how are you assessing that? Are you assessing that by x-ray and or um, looking at their body? Okay, yeah, so you're holding up an x-ray here. But let, let me ask you this, Peter. How ac can those x-rays change? And this is out of curiosity. Can those x-rays change depending on how they're standing during the x-ray? Like if they did it one day and they're in a certain position and then the next day in a different position, can it change the results and what you're looking at? Yeah, so what, what the goal of the x-ray is is to have a point on the wall you look, you want somebody to naturally look at a specific point. So you want to say, hold your head and look straight ahead. So you can take the angle of where the eyes are. And then, let's say six months down the road after, you know, sleeping differently or getting adjusted or doing something to help improve your curve, give them the same instructions, stand straight. You can see what the angles of the, the eyes are, and then you'll see a better curve. So, mm. you know, if, if let's say somebody is naturally because they're working on their on their posture um, and they're doing they're doing specific things, their whole entire body structure is going to change based on that that neck X, next X-ray. But, yes, you're right. You can put somebody's head into extension and force a curve in there, but then you'll be able to see their eyes are looking up. So so it's a level of the eyes. And then you look at the spine in, in, in uh, contrast to that. Oh, that makes sense. Okay, so you're keeping the variables the same, and that's the way you're testing it. How often are, should you test this? Let's say somebody starts working on their posture, and we'll talk about ways to do that. How often should we test with these x-rays doing it the same way? Um, if, if you're in a program working on it, you take a three-month spot shot and then a six-month follow-up x-ray. If you see an improvement three months and six months, then – you you wouldn't you wouldn't take another one for a year just to make sure that everything is uh, moving in the right direction. You just want to see progress in the right direction because tissue remolds slowly in older individuals, and, but faster in younger individuals. So so you know we just we just want to see improvement in the right direction, and it will continue to improve over a period of time. Okay, that makes sense. So sleep position is very important because obviously we're spending a lot of time in bed, and if we could do something that will help get that curve back while we're unconscious. You know, why not do that? It's a great biohack, especially, you know, when you don't have to think about it. I know there's some studies that we spoke about in the last interview that show side position is the best. And they're referencing a lot of these mouse studies. I think it was a rat studies possibly. And you made the case that their spinal cord is very different than the human spinal cord, right? Yeah, absolutely. So for, uh, I, I, might, I don't even know, I might have a, a, that, that same picture. Uh, yeah. But anyways, when you're looking at like, so let's let's just discuss. This is a law that we didn't talk about, but this is something that you can argue again. What controls everything in the human body? The nervous system, right? Or the brain yeah. through the nervous system. So then how important is it that your nervous system functions optimally from now and for the rest of your life? It's significantly important. So the structure of your spine directly affects the health and integrity of that nervous system. So when the spine is out of alignment or the spine is broken down due to poor biomechanics and sleeping position, you affect the way the nervous system functions. So the nervous system controls everything. When, when we're looking at a variable like, oh, yeah, 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 there's 5% more pressure on the heart when there's a 30% reduction in blood pressure at night when you're sleeping anyways, that's negligible. Like that in, in the heart, that stress isn't enough to cause any issues with the heart. And then when you look at glymphatic drainage, glymphatic drainage was looked at in a rat whose, whose cervical spine is completely opposite ours. So when we look at the human frame and the human structure, 
We want to sleep in a position because remember, the one time you're in the potentially the same position for eight hours, giving the tissue a chance to remold, heal, and, and, and rejuvenate is that night when you're sleeping. And if you're putting it in a, in a contorted, twisted, torqued position, you're causing dysfunction to the structure and thus the nervous system. So you're causing health-related issues in almost every organ due to the position that you're sleeping in because of the, because of the, the, the way that the, the structure affects the function. That makes sense. So you're, you're making the case that side position is not optimal if we want to achieve this process of restoring that cervical curve. Uh, but actually you recommend lying on your back uh, and you have developed a, a neck nest pillow that actually helps you restore that curve even faster. Talk about that, why you created it and why lying on your back is the optimal way to do it. Well, so we, we talk about, you know, the, that the average individual will toss and turn about 40 times a night. Well, That's crazy. Why is that? Like, like, what's the reason for that? Like, so you're falling asleep in a position and then 20 minutes later, you're moving out of that position in, in, into what position you're not in control of it. What's in control of it? Your brain, right? Your subconscious brain. And it's in control because of the one of the number one reasons you toss and turn is because the body is in pain. Mm. So what I tell people is I say, follow the goat. Do, let's do the, the movie test. What, try to watch a two-hour movie in the position you fall asleep in. And it's not possible because you're, 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 you're not starting with the end in mind. You're putting yourself in this contorted, side-lying position, and it, it's not natural for the, for the spine. So when you're looking at, like, how did we start out sleeping like this? And I go all the way back to my original story of sleep. I can still remember when I was six years old, I grew up in Malden, Massachusetts, and that was on a busy city street, cars going by. My room, my bed had a window, was, was up against a window, and that was on my front porch. And there was a bus stop right in front of my house. So the only thing I could think about was I thought somebody was going to smash through that glass and steal me and kidnap me. Like, that's what I'm thinking as, as a six years old. So I would curl up in a ball and I put, you know, stuffed animals all over me. And I was only able to fall asleep feeling protected. So that is why we, we so when you're curled up in like an ostrich in a little ball and your head's in a little cocoon, you feel protected. So we were never taught to sleep correctly. We would just go to your room and fall asleep. Go to your room and fall asleep. And most of us, it's a stress. It was a stressful time, so we fall asleep feeling protected, curled up in a ball. And then my my stuffed animals were all on my floor. I remember sometimes I would land on the floor, and, and then you just end up wherever you are, and you're not in control. Now I can fall asleep because we created this whole kind of process around it. You could put a glass of water on my chest, and I wake up, and that glass of water will still be on my chest, and I do not move all night long. I never wake up in pain and think about all of the structural healing that has occurred because my body has been in this nice restorative position all night long. That's impressive. I always remember you sharing that about the glass on your chest and it'll be there in the morning. Hey, Keto Camper, I want to interrupt the video real quick to share with you what I believe is one of the most important nutrients that we should be taking every single day. Most people are deficient in this nutrient, and it's responsible for over 400 enzymatic activities in your body. And your body just doesn't make it, so it's required to be taken in a high-quality supplement or from high-quality foods. The problem with the food is that our soil is depleted, and it's hard to get this quality nutrient. So what is this nutrient? It's called magnesium. But I'm going to share something with you very fascinating. Check this out. Upgraded Formulas has this incredible product called Upgraded Magnesium. And Barton Scott, the developer of this product and company, he's a brilliant guy. He created nanoparticle magnesium, which has the ability to penetrate your membranes and go right into your cell. There's a 99.99 percentage absorption rate. Now, this is unheard of because with other magnesium products, you better believe it's not that high. 
And there's an interesting study they're doing with upgraded mag. I want to share with you real quick. Early results from a sleep study with Dr. Sachin Patel showed that the average doctor in the group using this product has achieved an improvement of over 35% in deep sleep, more sleep studies than a double-blind controlled placebo study with upgraded magnesium is coming sooner. And you better believe those results are going to be super exciting. We already know this. Upgraded magnesium is easily the best supplement you can take for better sleep, including deep sleep, muscle aches, cramping, and any other signs of a magnesium deficiency, which is so common, unfortunately. What makes upgraded formulas unique, as I mentioned, is that it's a nanoparticle. This means it is absorbed very rapidly and efficiently by your blood cells. They produce a plasma-like version of minerals that the body recognizes and absorbs without digestion. And the results are phenomenal. I really believe just taking this for a couple of nights, you'll notice a big difference. So if you want to get upgraded formulas, upgraded mag, and any of their products. They also do some incredible hair mineral analysis tests to see your mineral imbalances and deficiencies, et cetera, and other incredible products that we've referenced before. Head over to upgradedformulas.com and use the coupon code KETOSIS to get 15% off your entire order. That is upgradedformulas.com. Coupon code is KETOSIS to get 15% off your entire order. I'm going to drop a link for you down below in the notes of this video. Okay, let's go back to this video. I, I know when I look at my aura ring, which I know you love the aura ring as well, it gives you those white little um, shades when you wake up. And sometimes I feel like I, I've woken up throughout the night a lot more than what I see on the aura ring. Do you, how accurate do you think that is on the aura ring? Is it picking up every single time I'm tossing and turning? Or is it probably picking up the time where I'm tossing and turning, but staying awake for a little bit longer. And it's missing a few uh, times that I've woken up. Yeah. So there's restlessness and then there's awake time. So awake times typically fall in core temperature and heart rate. So you, 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 a lot of times you're getting that shallow awake sleep, not, not knowing it. Um, the, the restlessness, sometimes that can be a little inaccurate because remember it, it's thinking that your whole body's moving, right? So sometimes just your hands can move and that, mm. you know, pulling up a little restlessness type of type of scenario. But yeah, those those awake times tend to be really accurate because the more awake times you have, you're going to notice the lower your heart rate variability is if you if you're um, if you're an aura ring study or if you're you know, you really love to biohack you. You, you kind of understand that heart rate variability. So what we want to do is we want to allow, we want to get a day where we're at, we're at our maximum performance, where we feel really strong, where we feel tight in the stomach, right? Where, where you just know that you're, you're ready and you look at that heart rate variability um, reading and that's, that's your target. So yeah, at night when you have that light restlessness sleeping and you're tossing and turning a lot, you, you don't get that really deep good restorative sleep. Got it. That makes sense. And we're going to definitely dive deep into HRV uh, in a minute. I know that there are three primary reasons why somebody tosses and turns throughout the night. You mentioned two. You're in pain, which is very common. If the, the need for safety, which you mentioned as a kid. I sometimes do that as a cocoon too. My fiance makes fun of me. So I understand that. The third one is warm temperature. Desc uh, explain what happens there. Yeah. So in, in we're, we're being brought into um, the fitness gyms and and we're doing this, uh, the, the four week uh, sleep challenges. And what is some of the things that are different, like that are different a little bit in the, the fitness world is that people love to exercise, right? They're trying to either lose weight by increasing their aerobic activity or they're, they're trying to increase their metabolism. Well, when you increase your metabolism and let's say you work out or you exercise, that increased metabolism comes with an increased heart rate. An increased heart rate, increased metabolism is a higher temperature. So, so when, when we exercise late at night, um, our, our body temperature elevates. A byproduct of digestion, let's say we eat late at night, a byproduct is increased core temperature. Now, in order for you to get to sleep and to get into good deep sleep, we want to be in deep sleep within the first one third of our sleep cycle. So by the time we go to bed, let's say we go to bed at 930, an hour later, 
is 1030. We want to be in deep sleep. In order for us to get good deep sleep, our core temperature needs to drop. So if you're exercising late at night or you're eating late at night or you have alcohol and you're detoxing from that alcohol, these are all things, the byproduct of that is internal heat. So, and, and if you're using your covers incorrectly. So if you're doing something that is causing a byproduct of that is an increased core temperature, you're not going to get good deep sleep and you have a, a window of time to get good deep sleep for maximum restorative sleep. And that is typically right around midnight because you have an internal energy spike, a natural energy spike. So you want to be in deep sleep by that energy spike. So, so you want to make sure when you get to sleep that your core temperature drops quickly. So for instance, last, last night, what was it? No, no. Two nights ago was Tuesday night. What do I do on Tuesday night? I mountain bike heavily. I know on Tuesday night, my, uh, my aura ring's going to be crashed on Wednesday morning because yeah. my, uh, my, my heart rate is so high and my, um, my metabolism is so high that my core temperature doesn't drop until like two in the morning and, and I, and I lose it. So I wake up tired. I understand it, but I make it back up on Wednesday. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Same thing happens to me. Sundays are my uh, basketball two hours in the sun here in Miami fasted state. And every Sunday night, when I wake up Monday morning, my resting heart rate is up. My HRV is down. But again, this is a stress that when we recover, we actually get stronger over time. As long as you're recovering and adapting, I am curious what is your average uh, resting heart rate overnight? What does the aura give you on average? About 47, 48. 47. Yeah, mine's around that. Mine's around like 45, 46. Mm -hmm. um, for me, I know when I eat before bed, uh, my scores are awful. I wake up groggy. I don't tend to exercise before bed, but to your point, a lot of people who go to gyms, they'll take like an 8 p.m. class or a 9, 9 p.m. class. I gen generally tell my students, if you're going to work out in the evening, because actually I looked at some studies as I was building out some, some lessons for my academy students. And I was looking at when's the best time to exercise. Uh, and it showed some really good research that we're, we have better grip strength and strength overall, and even some endurance later on in the afternoon slash evening versus the morning. So I thought, hey, that would be a good time to do something like that. But give yourself about three hours to kind of cool down and go to bed. Would you say that's a good rule of thumb, three hours? Or would you rec recommend something longer or shorter? You know, un un I, so unfortunately, every everybody's different, right? So I have to have my exercise done, you know, for it not to affect my sleep by four in the afternoon. So I mm. have to really be a good five hours. Um, and it all depends on the intensity. You can do, uh, uh, you can do a, um, you know, uh, you know, like a muscle tone workout, right? So do the heavy weights and you can, you can get away doing that, you know, within three hours. But anything high aerobic, see, so high aerobic, typically they say your, you know, your, your metabolism stays elevated for two to three hours. My, my metabolism stays elevated longer than that. Mm -hmm. And then the issue is, is then when that happens, when your metabolism's high, you're dropping your body, you're, you're, you're depleting your um, carbohydrates. So when you go to sleep with depleted carbohydrates, you actually, believe it or not, can interfere with your sleep patterns. So normally I don't eat anything before bed, but there's nothing wrong, especially if you exercise, having a, a carbohydrate snack before bed because you, you think, oh, that, that'll keep me out of ketosis in the morning. It actually doesn't because the stress that the, the, the body is going to call for that and actually can cause a slumber, a slumber, mm -hmm. a slumber <laughs> state to have a little bit of carbohydrate if you, if, if you need to, uh, you know, because I know a lot of us eat in an eating window. You know, yeah. that eating window is a guide. So, you know, what I tell what I tell my patients is use it as a guide. And if there's a point where your, your sugar levels drop and you don't want to go to sleep with, with a body that's craving carbohydrates. Now, if you keto adapted, right, and you didn't deplete um, the carbohydrates because your liver glycogen usually is going to be able to make that up. Um, then, then, then you're good. So there are different variables, you know? Yeah, it makes sense. You got to just test it out. HRV is a good gauge for that. Um, before we, we shift into HRV with the sleep position, you develop the neck nest. And if you're watching on YouTube, you could see it right behind, uh, Dr. Peter, uh, he's going to demonstrate exactly how it works. 
how to use it. I know you say to start off, you know, with I think an hour and then build your way up. You could correct me if I'm wrong. I actually have one. I have, I've had one for a couple of years now. It's made a big difference for my lower back issues, but talk about the neck nest and how to use it and explain it in a way for those who are listening on the podcast, they could still understand it too. Yeah. So when, when you look at sleep, or let's look at the body, right? Let's do another law, another law. It's not really, it's a, it's a well-accepted law. If you don't use it, you lose it right? Everybody yeah. knows that. So if you put your arm in, if you want to get rid of an elbow joint, you don't want the elbow anymore. Don't use it. Put your arm in a cast. It will degenerate the arm. And within two years, you won't have a joint there anymore, right? If you don't use it, you lose it. So anytime you support the body, you put a sneaker on, you're going to lose the arch. The more support when you ask and you support the body, you make the body weaker with whatever you're supporting. So when you see these pillows, cervical support, great cervical support, oh, great head support, back support, you, what you're basically that saying is they don't understand biomechanics. They're just trying to tell you, oh, oh, we're going to make you more comfortable by supporting you, but we're going to destroy your structure while you stand. Like that. So, a, w- go ahead. Would would that be the same case with these? knee support, elbow support, long-term use of knee support, elbow support, yes. these these high uh, top shoes that, that restrict your ankles and support them. But over time, if you don't use it, you lose it. It actually makes you weaker in those areas. Yeah, you're going to, and then it's also stress biomechanics. You're putting more stress on the knee and the, and the hip because you're taking up, you know, everything's supposed, it's a, we're a closed biokinetic chain. Everything is supposed to work together. When you restrict something in the chain, you're asking something to work more. It's just like, being at a, at a in your workspace when you when you end up getting rid of half of your workforce everybody has to work harder and that tends to stress the system wear the system down create more scar tissue which then in return causes more problems so to get back the, so you don't want you don't want more support it's not the more support you have the better so in in contrast to that we want to use distraction when we sleep we want not we don't want that weight of our head supported we want to use the weight of our head almost like off the back of something so you know you can you can put something like something under the neck put the weight of the head over it so like a slinky you're distracting the cervical spine lightly stretching a curve into back into the neck you're reversing the damage of the weight of the head being forward, right? Because the weight of our head being forward, we have to use and engage the muscles to hold it up. If the weight of our head is back, we're stretching the tissue, reversing that effect. So that's what the neck nest does. It puts you in your neck in a position that is sustainable all night long and gently distracts the neck over eight hours. Well, one hour, we start one hour a night. And then the entire body will start to untwist due to that forward head posture that caused the body to twist to begin with. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you the positioning, that the, the correct positioning of the neck nest, because I have thousands of people using a neck nest. And inevitably, where I'm some, somewhere, they're like, oh, yeah, I've used it or I used it for a long time, but I just really can't get used to it. I'll ask them, show me how you're using it. And it is not the correct way because most people will take a neck nest put it flat which it's which great and then they'll rest their head on the back supporting their head and yes it's still going to be comfortable like that but you're supporting the head too much and you're not getting the distraction that we want with the neck nest so so the neck nest is designed believe it or not to be put on its edge so we put a neck nest on its edge, and then what we do is we take it and we put the whole thing under our neck so the weight of our head is just off of the back of the neck nest, and it's basically hanging there, lightly distracting the curve back into my neck. Mm, yeah, I made the same mistake when I first started using it. I did it the wrong way, too. And, and most, most people do. So it, we're, we're changing a lot of the, the pictures on the website because, yeah, whatever. So, um, so the uh, so that is how you you use it. 
And, and to your point, we were talking about this earlier. You asked me how my trip to Italy was. Well, one night, it was really hot in Italy. It was great. We had a great time. But we were I was out of a backpack, and I was going to an Airbnb. And we were walking around that day, and I'm like, you know what? I'm not going to bring my neck nest. I'm just going to deal with what I have when I get to the Airbnb. And I'm not going to lie to you, in Europe, they don't really, I don't think, put too much emphasis on the pillows, especially in this Airbnb. So I went in there. I'm like, oh, no. Oh, no. There's no way I'm going to be able to sleep like this. Was it like a really hard pillow? It was a hard pillow, Ah. really fluffy. You know, like like my my, it, it would have destroyed me. So what I ended up doing is I created this like three. I have this like three pillow sleeping position, and then I roll up a towel mm. to do the same thing. So whether you use a neck nest or you use a soft, soft, soft pillow, you just get something under your neck so that the weight of your head is about an inch off of the 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 the, the bed. And then that that's good positioning. Yeah, uh, that's that's interesting. Okay, I love that. And for those who are watching, you saw how Peter demonstrated how to use it. If you're listening and if you want to watch the demonstration, you could watch the interview. It's on the YouTube channel, uh, youtube.com slash Keto Camp. Your website also has a lot of illustrations and demonstrations. And Keto Campers, Peter hooked you all up with a special deal to get uh, the neck nest and some other goodies. So if you go to necknest.com slash Keto Camp, you can learn more about the product. And I'll put a video you know. there too on how to use it. Perfect. So based on what yeah. we just talked about. So we'll, he'll put a video there. So we'll put a link for that down below. If you're watching on YouTube, it's down below. Um, I'm curious. There's some nights, personally, I'm going to ask you a question for myself. There's some nights where, you know, I go to bed at the same time usually every night unless I'm traveling. That's around 9.30. Uh, even though my fiance is more of a night owl and she wants to stay up later. I'm like, nope, 9.30, we're going to bed. Some nights I'll fall at my latency. I'll fall asleep about. 10, 15 minutes, and I'll get some really good sleep. Other nights, I tend to just lay there for like 30 minutes, 45 minutes, and then I'll fall asleep. And, I'll, and I know that just by my experience, but then I'll look at my latency score and it'll verify that too. I can't pinpoint you know, why that is on those nights. And it probably could be something I ate or something that changed throughout my day. But what have you seen in terms of the most common reasons why that latency tends to be increased and people don't fall asleep? Well, that, that's good. So I'm the same as you. 9.30, in bed, out, done, right? So just recently, we had a flood that ruined our entire warehouse at Necknest. We had a, a foot and a half of water. And, and think about that, right? So I have to shut off my brain and be able to get to sleep. That night, I did not, you know, I wasn't able to turn it off. Even though I was focused on the same things to put myself to sleep, subconsciously, there was so, still something on my mind I had to figure out. And then I had woken up at four in the morning and consequently it was the same thing that was still on your mind. So when you don't clear something out in your brain, whether you think it's cleared out or you not think it's cleared out, if it's something that's still in your subconscious brain, you have to go through a sleep cycle sometimes to clear it out so most of the time i'm good i can i can let it go think about it in the morning write down my notes figure out how i need to tackle it let it go and then the next day i wake up and then i can continue working on it so when something's not figured out one of the problems with our brain is subconsciously we're still trying to figure out while we're dreaming right mm-hmm. and then that's it, it's it's not being able to let go of something that doesn't keep us out of there and then also, anything that keeps your heart rate up and anything that keeps your body core temperature. You could have eaten something that you don't think is an issue, but your body is detoxifying it. Let's say peanuts. Peanuts has alpha toxin A or B, one of those alpha toxins. And a lot of people de- have to detoxify from peanuts all night long. So it's something that produces heat. You know, and so there are different variables that keep people out of, uh, out of that deep. Yeah, that makes sense. It could have been a combination of both, maybe something in my unconscious that I didn't, that I needed to solve, or maybe something that I ate that had oxalates or some plant toxin. So it's just interesting, but it's not the norm. It's, 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 um, maybe happens once every two weeks or something like that. I just curious to me. I, I was like looking at those stats and wondering what, what did I do to cause this? So I know that, um, heart rate variability is something that you study a lot. You teach your patients how to achieve, um, a better, 
adaptability with the nervous system. And I love to dive deep into heart rate variability and how it is one of the best markers to assess this amazing nervous system, those two branches, the sympathetic versus the parasympathetic. So let's start with that, how the nervous system works and what exactly is HRV? I thought we want, most people think you want that heart to beat every you know, second uh, you know, in a normal rhythm and why that's not what we want to do. So let's talk about that. Yeah, so so the body, like when you go for a run, and you run around the lake, or let's say, and you, and you and you exercise. Well, your body needs to depend on a very specific amount of sugar coming to the cells, so the heart beats very rhythmically. So you're right. Every they're in a sixty second heart rate, you know, every, one one you know one beat every second, really rhythmic. It puts a significant stress on the heart because the stress is on the same portion of the heart over a, a given period of time. Now, let's say you're then now going to go to sleep, and which is the opposite of exercise. Now you're so exercise is sympathetic dominant, and sleep is parasympathetic dominant. Well, now the heart will not beat very consistently. It will be, but instead of let's say in sixty beat like every second you might have a bump and a bump, boom, boom, bump, 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 bump. It might be 0.5 seconds, and then a okay. second point, you know, one point one seconds, then 0.75 seconds. So it rhythmically beats, which stre- spreads the stress over the heart, but you're more adaptable for whatever comes, and then the body would become rhythmic. So when you are running a, in a parasympathetic state. There are specific organs that are being that are within focus that are that are taking the major amount of emphasis, and those are your thrive systems, your hormone hormonal system, your digestive system, and your immune system. So it's not a coincidence when somebody has an issue with digestion, they also have hormonal imbalances, or when they were really 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 sick with let's say COVID, or they get really chronic infections, they also have digestion issues because you can't affect one of those systems without affecting the other. So the parasympathetic, in order to have good rhythm, in order to have a good healthy system, you need to be able to have a healthy thrive system. In order to be able to be very adaptable, work for, work well under stress and run from a tiger, you need to have a good survive system. So the way the body recharges and plugs back in at night is thrive. When your body's using all the apps, let's picture our body as a cell phone. Picture during the day, unplugged, using all your apps. You got your ways going. You know you have a, you know you're calling people. You got your music playing. You're using a lot of performance out of that phone to keep it ready. But if you don't plug it in at night parasympathetically to thrive it or to recharge it. Over a period of time, you're going to have this imbalance where your phone can just die. You don't. You internalize it with chronic disease. And, and chronic disease is an adaptation of that imbalance. That's a great analogy. I've never heard it put with thrive versus survive, survive systems. That makes a lot of sense to me. And they're both very important systems and very important branches that we want to tap into back and forth. But we don't want to be locked into either one of them too too much. And most people are in a sympathetic um, survival state. And can I, I'm going to add to that one for one second. Yeah. Now, 80% of all of your thrive systems, which are your parasympathetic systems, come from your vagus nerve. And when you lose the cervical curve in your neck, you constrict a sheath or, or this, this, this little opening. And there are three nerves in that opening. There's the glossopharyngeal, so people get things that caught in their throat or they always have to clear their throat. Spinal accessory, tightness in the traps. And the third is the vagus nerve. So due to poor sleeping position, when you have that forward head posture, you're constricting the vagus nerve and you're getting parasympathetic inhibition. So a lot of times people work and they meditate and they just say, I still have adrenal glands that are stressed. I just can't help my adrenals. A lot of times it's not because you're sympathetic dominant because of your state. It's because you're parasympathetic inhibited due to the structure. 
And that's what mm. nobody is talking about. Yeah, that is that is interesting. So it's not necessarily with these individuals that they're locked into sympathetic is that they don't have the ability to really tap into the parasympathetic. And that is a result of primarily them losing that curvature in their neck and restoring that back will help all these processes. So that that is that is interesting to me. All right. So I want to talk a little bit more about that. I know that heart rate variability, the goal is to increase it. And everybody has a different average, a different baseline. I know genetics play a role there. There's different factors. So how would you recommend? I know we use the Aura Ring. I know there's other devices out there. I'm just going to share with you what I teach my students, and you could give me coaching on, you know, it's good or bad or whatever you want to add to it. I tell my students to get an Aura Ring or a Whoop Band, or there's a device called Hanu Health that tracks heart rate. But get a device, use the same device to track. Let's get seven days of an average, get your baseline. Now that we have your baseline, let's do some different things to work on building it up over time. Like, for example, when I first got the Aura Ring five or six years ago, my average HRV was around 35-ish. Now, after I've done a lot of things, including the neck nest, it's around 65-ish, right? So I'm trending in the right direction. So is that a good way to do it, or do you have a different approach for your patients? No, I, I, I love it. So with whatever you're using, right, it doesn't matter whether it's Aura, if it's Whoop, if it's the Pulse, uh, uh, Polar, they have a heart rate variability it's be consistent with it, right? And don't compare yourself to somebody else, right? Yeah, that's important. Like, yeah. That is so important because everybody like, you know, you know, let's say you get a 65, you know, I'm, I'm 53. Can I get a 65? Yeah, but is my heart rate variability always at 65? No, uh, my goal is 52, right? Because as you age, things change and, and, and stuff like that. But what you have to do in the higher doesn't necessarily mean the healthier, it's just how your state is. And, and, and what it needs. So you monitor it regularly, just not making any changes, and you do a two week average. And then you just find out where your average is. Then what you do is you then start journaling when you feel your best. You know, I, 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 I use a lot with weight, not that people need to focus on their weight, but a fluctuation of one or two pounds in the morning that's swelling or not swelling a lot of times. So it's not necessarily you're gaining fat. When you retain fluid, you're going to have lower heart rate variability readings. So yeah. use weight, use how much energy you have, use, use, use heart rate variability, and use all of those together. And then how are you feeling? And then picture a day when you're at your best because you can quantify that. Like, what is it? My, my strength is better in the gym. And then know what your HRVs are to need to attain to be able to get there. And then, and then do the studies on your own, be your own doctor, because you know your body better than anybody else. You might not have the confidence in knowing the numbers, but you know when you feel good and then look at what that number is and then try to achieve that feeling, you know, try to achieve that number that you know that you can get. I love that advice because it is one thing to use a device that gives you a score and some data, but it's also important to pay attention to your body. You don't want a, a ring to determine how you feel. You want to use all the data and then also tap into your intuition and pay attention. And journaling is a good way to do that. So I love that you combine both. Uh, it's a great idea. What are some of the big old, biggest needle movers when it comes to HRV that you've seen for yourself and your patients? Uh, biggest needle mover, first, core temperature, dropping your core temperature quickly. A lot of times you'll notice that you'll have higher HRV readings two days after the exercise. So, so like you said, when you play basketball, yes, that night's gonna be a little tanked, but it, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't play basketball. Your adaptation the following night's gonna be a much better yeah. reaction because of, because of adaptation. So, so, so that's another thing. And then, and then obviously decrease in the food, stay away from caffeine, don't have any stimulants. You know, after new, I mean, I, I don't have any stimulants after 7 a.m. Uh, well, no. So I wake up at 6.30 after 7.30. After 8 a.m., I don't have any. I have maybe a cup of coffee or half a cup of coffee uh, in the morning sometimes. And um, and then, uh, oh, my God, there was, a, there was another one. Hold on, hold on, hold on. HRV, HRV, core temperature dropping. Create a safe environment and get out of your own head. I can't remember what I was going to say. Holy <laughs> mackerel. Oh, yeah, here we go. Um, pressure. So what I'm finding it, well, so HRV is improved 
when you have a greater parasympathetic uh, tone, when you have greater parasympathetic tone. What we found is using a neck nest, improving the curve in your neck, just changing your structure will improve HRV, like you just said, Ben. And then second, which was really interesting to me because I never, ever, ever expected it. I started using a sleep mask. And remember when I, we started at the beginning, when I was six years old, all I wanted to do is feel protected. So just like the ostrich that sticks his head in the ground, I would just use a pillow and place it over my eyes. And I'm like, oh, I'm doing enough. I'm doing enough. It wasn't until I used a sleep mask and put direct pressure against my eyes, stimulating my parasympathetic nervous system, which improved my HRV by 30%, which was Damn. crazy. Now, I that's not a study that's out there. I look for it, but that is what I'm assuming is happening, is that the direct pressure on your eyes is um is creating uh and i and i tried this with you know our good friend ben greenfield i, I sent him i'm like ben put you know put pressure on your eyes and tell me what it does with your hrv increases his hrv so it i did it with mercola you know and so when when you use pressure against your eyes for some reason it's improving hrv readings yeah, we, the reason is because that feeling of safety that you mentioned that we tend to uh, want to achieve for you was like all the pillows, same thing. I'm going to do it too. I, I'm not using a sleep mask, so I'm going to test it out now for myself and I'll give you some feedback on what it does because I, I look at my HRV every single day. That'll be the only variable that I'll change and I'll let you know what happens for me. You, you made a good point though with sometimes we'll see that HRV drop from basketball, from a certain stress doesn't mean it's a bad thing. When the body adapts, then in two days or so, you'll see a higher increase in that HRV. And that's actually what you want, that adaptability to help you become more resilient. For me, every time I travel to uh, Utah, where I've seen you several times, I'm gonna see you in a few months at Dr. Pompa's event, Live It to Lead It. But whenever I travel to Elevation, I'm here in Miami, we're below sea level. Whenever I go to Vegas or Colorado or Utah, my HRV during that trip suffers. My heart resting heart rate increases. I feel palpitations at night. I come back to Miami and I get this huge increase in HRV that whole week and a lowering resting heart rate. And all my numbers are like transformed from the stress. So to your point, it's not necessarily a bad thing short term. No, because it, it's all about adaptability, right? So, you know, nobody's going to have perfect sleep every night. I went to Italy and I couldn't sleep on the plane too much. My HRV was four. Zero's dead, right? Damn. So, so <laughs> my HRV was four. I've never got that. Now, how do you think you feel the next day when yeah, you're a pure four? Crap. You're no, you were four sluggish. points away from death, right? And guess what? My body adapted. And what takes a beating when your HRV is four? What three systems? The the hormones, digestion, and immune system. So what do you think my body responded? Do you think somebody on the plane got me sick? Or do you think my body got sick? My body was so weakened, it gave me an immune system response. We all think we get sick. It's adaptation to bring your health back. So don't think about somebody coughing on you and that, that person got you sick. That's not what happens. Don't blame your neighbor for getting you sick. You're sick and everybody is going to be sick after the time change in September. Everybody will be. And they're going to blame it on kids going back to school. These snotty little rascals gave me my, my gave me my snots and, and all this other crap that I hear about. Oh, flu season. It's all about the stress on your own system. So for me to come back from a four and then the next night get a 15 and, you know, and, and have that low HRV, my digestive system's taken, my immune system's taken, and my hormones, I, I was swollen. This watch that I, I bought wasn't, didn't, couldn't even fit my wrist. And the ring was probably tight on your I, fingers. I, I took it. I couldn't wear it. Yeah, yeah. So I went home. I got sick for five days like a normal individual should. Now I'm, I'm, my HRV shot through mm -hmm. the roof. 
<coughs> because oh, sorry, there we go. Because <laughs> it's adaptation. So just because yeah. you tank things, and if you bring it back the next night, never going to be an issue. But if you have tanked HRV over a long period of time, that that that's going to be an issue. Yeah, uh, interesting. Wow, four. And we changed the clocks not in September. I don't think oh, not oh, until yeah, maybe November. I, I, whatever. Yeah, November. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but we start to lose light quickest in September. Yeah, I yeah, you're correct. But and then everybody stays up past the same time. It's 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 a mess. We should do something on that. Sure. Yeah, we should. We should. Um, let's finish the conversation with the glymphatic system, which you actually mentioned earlier. But I want to talk a little bit more about that. When which sleep cycle? Well, first of all, what is the glymphatic system? What's happening with the brain during this system? And then which sleep cycle activates this uh, glymphatic system the most? So let's just, we'll, we'll talk about, like, it's very simple. The, mm -hmm. the, the, the brain in cells, it's not just the brain, it's every cell in the body has this, this system that, that flushes around it to get rid of toxins and to, you know, bring nutrients and, and flush toxins out of the system. And that happens through our glymphatic system. So this is this is a flow of fluid based around these cells. So it, it, so there's something at night called pre-stress, which means you wake up in the morning taller than any other part of the day because all of your joints swell. Your joints don't have blood supply. What do they have? They swell with fluid. That fluid comes into the joint flushes the joint, gives nutrients to the joint. And then when you stand up, that pre-stress causes, and uh, well, they say, that I don't think 200%, but they, that, was, that was a study. 200, you're 200% more likely to injure yourself in the morning within the first hour of when you wake up than any other part of the day. That's because everything's swollen because of that lymphatic, that, that lymphatic flow. Wow. So there's a study that was stated that lymphatic flow improves better on your side and that was done based on rats and yes technically if you sleep on your side the, the the there's a there's a vein that 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 drains easier on the side but more importantly glymphatic drainage and that flow works the best with when your structure and your spine is aligned and when you walk the spine works as a spring and with vibration and movement, that's ultimately what gets everything flushed out. So you don't have to be really worried about it at night. You need to be more worried about the structure during the day because that has a much greater effect on the flow during the whole day. So that is kind of my, my argument is glymphatic drainage happens at night with everybody. And, and you there's never been a study stating that on your side, it happens better in humans. It's only been done in rats and the structure of a rat is completely different. So that is my argument against that study is it's not applicable to a human spine because they're only looking at the cells and not looking at the, uh, the whole picture. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. That's fascinating. I wanna take a quick break from the video you're watching to share something with you that has made a big difference with my health and the thousands and thousands of students that I teach all across the world. Now, this is a unique device that has been shown to help with skin health, sore muscles, wrinkles, psoriasis, eczema, scoliosis, migraines, sleep issues, arthritis, acne, scar tissue, wound healing, relaxation, and also boost testosterone levels. What am I talking about? What is this miracle drug? Well, it's not a miracle drug. It's red light therapy. As you can see here, this is called photobiomodulation. And I use this red light therapy device every single day. Not only do I use it, my fiance uses it. Our dogs and cats love it. And the device I have here is from Bond Charge. Bond Charge has a different range of big panels, small panels, from affordable to ones that are a little bit more money, depending on how much you want. And I love this product. I feel so good. And it doesn't take a lot of time to get all these benefits. I simply take off my glasses, which is Bond Charge glasses, by the way, turn it on. And I have it running for 20 minutes once a day. And turn it on. And as you can see, I just leave it there on my desk as I work. 10, 20 minutes. 
uh, per day will suffice. And it makes a big difference. You're going to notice a big improvement with your skin health and all the things we mentioned earlier in just a matter of weeks. So if you want to get your hands on this Bond Charge red light device or get their big panels, they also have panels that you could take on the go that are more affordable, then head over to bondcharge.com slash keto camp and use the coupon code keto camp to get 15% off your red light device. Or as a matter of fact, your entire order, any product, you can get 15% off with that nice coupon code KETOCAMP. So whether it's these Bond Charge blue light blocking glasses, their sauna blanket, or any of their awesome products, use that coupon code KETOCAMP at checkout. We'll drop a link down below. Go check them out. They are awesome. And let's get back to today's video. All right, Peter. Our last question is about gratitude, vitamin G. What are you grateful for today, my friend? Well, I'm grateful for uh, the gift of knowledge that have been given by God. And, uh, you know, it really, ultimately, I feel like I'm in my zone, right? In the, when, when, when I'm, when you're on purpose and you feel like you've been, you've figured something out and, and you're so passionate about it and you want to tell the world, I'm grateful for people like you to be able to give me the platform to be able to share this with as many people as possible, because then I'm sure that you get, you know, hundreds of people that want to be on your podcast, you know, all the time. And this is my second time being on there. And I'm just so grateful for you to be able to give me the space. And I and we know each other personally. And, and you know, just for all of your listeners, you are a product of, of uh, you know, you're very transparent. What you say is what you believe and that's how you live. I see it with you, you know, through everything. And you can only be like that because you live in gratitude and you're on purpose. And I'm just very grateful to be aligned with somebody like you. So I appreciate it. I appreciate that, Peter. I'm very grateful to know you. You're brilliant the way you teach. It's fun. And I'm grateful that uh, Dr. Pompa connected us and uh, we're going to have some more good times ahead. Peter, where is the best place to check you out? Well, the website to get your neck nest and that special deal is necknest.com slash keto camp. But where else can the listeners go? They can find me on uh, TikTok. Uh, Instagram and Facebook at Dr. Sleep Right. We'll put that in the notes down below. Peter, thank you, brother. I appreciate you and I'll see you soon in uh, Utah. Thanks, buddy. I look forward to it.